the Ernst group okay. and get right. the uh, right. here. And you can get right. them as a site yeah. if you want to have yeah. that. And you can actually move that over if you want to have them up here. Hi, Giles and Amy. Hello. 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 It's uh, Bruce in Gothenburg here. <laughs> no. How is it, Bruce, in Gothenburg? Uh, yeah, all good, thank you. Um, we have a, a room of people, so no doubt people will be coming back in. We've just uh, had a little break for lunch. How are you? <laughs> Yeah, good. I got a bit freaked out. I didn't realise that my uh, agenda had turned to local time. So it said that I was reading it saying that it started at 12.30. And I was thinking, oh, I thought it was 12.30 in the UK, 1.30. Uh, but yeah. So that panic's over. And also um, had a little bit of a hiccup getting here. But we're here now. Good. Well, that's good news. Um, and there's been a slight change in not the for, the format basically we're inviting questions on menti which is sort of an online um way to submit questions and hopefully that'll get a few more from the floor sounds good are you, are you going to go through the menti link or yeah i've got a link on the slides um yeah. so it should all be fine so i'll get it up on my phone and ask anonymous questions if needed yeah, yeah, I've got um, a link to them in about three of the um, uh, slides and I can go back onto it again. So the audience won't be able to see them, I've hidden them, only you can see them, so we you can curate the... Yes, yeah, yeah, when they speak. Okay. Otherwise it will be <laughs> just a, a, an ominous voice from the distance. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully we'll get some more people to come in here. I wanna welcome you to the Digital Footprints panel session brought together by the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK. My name is Diana Magnuson and I am curator and historian at the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation at the University of Minnesota in the United States. And I will be the panel chair for today. And we're gonna start with a series of presentations from our speakers to be followed by a panel discussion facilitated by myself and hopefully aided by you all in the audience. We, Bruce and Giles and Amy really want to hear from you. So as you're listening, please be thinking of questions uh, and there will be an opportunity to have a discussion. Uh, we also are inviting 
folks here, but also online, if you would like to ask a question or offer advice, you can do that through menti.com and Bruce will be giving more details about that during his presentation. So I'd like to invite Giles and Amy and Bruce to introduce themselves. Giles is going to go first and then Amy and then Bruce and he'll start out the presentation. So many thanks for being here. We look forward to hearing from you. Uh, can I get that to go bigger? There we go. Giles, you're on screen. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Giles Pavey. I uh, lead data science at uh, Unilever, the um, consumer goods uh, manufacturer, making ice cream, uh, home care, uh, personal care, and uh, nutrition. And uh, I also have the uh, honor of being um, uh, honorary professor in uh, computer science at University College uh, London and uh, honorary fellow of mathematics at Oxford University. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Giles. Uh, and now if I go to Amy, this is a very strange, uh, way of doing it, but hey ho. Pin. And then if I go there, hey. Great. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Amy Orban. I'm a group leader at the MRC Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit at Cambridge. So my research group looks at social media use and general technology use and how it relates to adolescent well-being. So very interested in, in the data side. I've been working with the ESRC on, on that question for quite a while. I also do a lot of work in public policy. I sit on the British Academy Public Policy Committee, as well as I'm, a, I'm in the College of Experts for the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport um, at the UK government. So I um, live a couple of different uh, lives intersecting with my research as well. Thanks, Amy. So, um, I've invited uh, Giles and Amy along today to provide their thoughts and reflections on the work that we're doing. I've known Giles for some time now. His experience and expertise is invaluable, particularly as he spans somebody who's uh, both the business and academic communities. Uh, and as Amy said, I've been working with her over the past few years now, um, particularly in terms of providing advice and guidance on the kinds of data that we're particularly interested on and I'm going to be discussing today. Um, as highlighted, I'd really like to get um, questions, advice, tips, links, um, and we can do that through uh, mentid.com using the code 51043328. Um, I'll leave that up for two seconds. And by all means, feel free to ask questions, make comments, etc. as we go, and we'll tackle those towards the end. So I thought it'd be a, uh, useful to provide a little bit of background about UKRI, ESRC and data infrastructure. So the Economic and Social Research Council is one of seven research councils alongside Research England and Innovate UK that makes up UK research and innovation. Um, our vision is for an outstanding research and innovation system in the UK that gives everybody the opportunity to contribute to and benefit enriching lives locally, nationally and internationally. It doesn't flow off the tongue easily. Um, I'm pleased to say that about a week ago, UKRI finalised its budget allocations, which amount to about 25 billion over three years. So quite significant. It's also an increase in uh, our budget between 2021 and 2022 and 24, 25 of about 
rising from 7.7 .7 billion uh, per annum to 8.8 .8 billion. And ESRC's core budget uh, is also rising across that time from about 114 million a year to 122 million. This is modest compared to other research councils, particularly given the size of our community, importance of social and economic research in addressing key national and global challenges. Hence the importance of the work that I'll come on to talk about, which is demonstrating the importance of social sciences to address those cross-cutting challenges and to draw funding from the central uh, funds, such as the uh, infrastructure fund up there. So ESRC has been investing in data infrastructure for over 50 years. We are now the single largest public funder of social and economic uh, research data in the UK. Over the last five years, we've invested about 200 million in data collection, creation, curation and delivery. And spending on our data infrastructure program makes up about 11% of our annual spend. So what does that include? Well, it includes a series of data collections, so longitudinal studies and panel studies, such as understanding society, the UK birth cohorts at the Centre for Longitudinal Studies, and cross-sectional studies, such as the British election study. Alongside those, we have a series of data services, investments that make existing and new data available for research purposes and facilitating the use of those data through, for amongst other things, the provision of curation, support and training. So I'll come on to the talk about the programme of work that I've been leading on over the last five years, which comes under the umbrella of digital footprints. Now, the first question, what do we mean by digital footprints? Well, we know that people's interactions with the world are and with each other are increasingly digital. These can create digital footprint data, including internet, social media, geospatial, commercial, transactional, sensor and image. These are diverse, powerful, large scale, so highly detailed, digitally created and rapidly developing. And they can be harnessed to understand and address key research, business, and policy questions about our increasingly digital society. And over the last 10 years, ESRC has been undertaking a body of work that has been helping us to understand what we need to do in this space. Now, it started with a thing called the ESRC Big Data Network that was created about 2013 big data at the height of the uh, hype uh, curve at the time. Phase one established ADRN, which has now evolved onto ADR UK. Hopefully you caught Emma's presentation earlier. Phase two saw the creation of three business and local government data centers and a series of new and emerging forms of policy demonstrators as well. These investment has helped demonstrate what works and what doesn't in this landscape, where data are not normally collected for the purposes of research, privately held, often sensitive, and with a whole range of other uh, aspects as well. And over that time, we've also undertaken a series of strategic reviews to help us understand what further work was needed. That resulted in about five proposals around different aspects and interventions, including, for example, social media and civil society data. And it ultimately culminated in a proposal to the UKRI Infrastructure Fund in 2020, framed around new and emerging forms of data. Um, into responses to questions from the funding committee, we went back out to the community with a consultation focused around how the proposal would fit in with the landscape, who would work with it, why the specific intervention was needed, etc. So what did we find? Well, 
for the start, for a variety of reasons, we changed the framing, moving from new and emerging forms of data to digital footprint data. Turned out the data wasn't necessarily new or emerging, part of the established landscape, maybe old data, but new technologies, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, we had a ringing endorsement from the community that a specific invent intervention was needed. They highlighted digital footprint data cannot currently be, be used to its full potential. Researchers are limited by a number of challenges, including insufficient data access and infrastructure, a lack of leadership and coordination, significant um, needs around skills and training, underdeveloped methodology and theoretical development, uh, development and opaque ethical procedures. So, what's our vision? Well, over um, our vision is to provide the leadership, skills, coordination, and data infrastructure to deliver a transformational shift in the creation, access, and use of digital footprint data, fostering long term strategic partnerships with data owners, providing access to hundreds of diverse new and linked data sets to address areas of national and international interest where the creation, access and use of digital footprint data is critical. Digital footprints will be launched over two phases. Phase one, we have funding for. Phase two, we've been recommended for funding as part of the first UKRI wave of the infrastructure fund. That is subject to business case approval and is waiting ministerial announcement. So keep it under your hats, basically. Launched in April 2022, phase one uh, is set to close in 2024 and is comprised around three main components. An accelerator scheme, data services, and strategic advice to the ESRC. It's a 10 million pound program that's gonna be launched over about two and a half years and it'll lay the foundations for a much larger investment in digital footprints. So coming on to the components of phase one, the accelerator scheme uh, is focused on meeting the challenges uh, in the digital footprint uh, landscape, providing the foundations and knowledge to make that transformational shift. It will support a program of responsive, focused um, work that will inform the development of a flexible uh, and robust infrastructure for social science. We've allocated about 2.5 million. It's going to launch in the summer and close towards the end of November. We also have a series of data services. Uh, being provided by the Urban Big Data Centre in Glasgow and the Consumer Data Research Centre in Leeds and UCL. These were created back in 2014 as part of that big data network and as such provide a solid foundation from which to build. We are also com commissioning a strategic advice team to provide support and advice to ESRC high quality, sustained strategic advice to support us uh, developing the Digital Footprints program. A call will be launched shortly, when I say shortly, 20th of June. Um, and that ensures that we want to ensure that Digital Footprints builds on and integrates with existing programs, help shape related programs of work, which I'll come on to talk about, contribute towards synthesis and reviews in the business case, task that I'm going to be leading over the next few months. You don't envy me. Um, contributing towards uh, engagement with key stakeholders across business, policy, civil society and academia, and engaging with relevant programs across ESRC and UKRI. Um, you may have noticed we have a review of our data services uh, and we've just commissioned two uh, fellows to support us with that. So phase two is scheduled to start in 2023 and end in 29. 
Um, as said, it's subject to business case approval uh, to release funding from UKRI Infrastructure Fund of about £49 million. It's built on a similar model to ADR UK in that it will be led by an independent central hub that can coordinate, convene and develop and support a thriving interdisciplinary uh, community. This is crucial because we know that the landscape is incredibly busy, complicated, diverse, dynamic, and it's critical that we can reach across that and provide the leadership, connectivity and support needed to make that transformational shift and position digital footprints as a world leading institution. In doing so, it will engage in outreach and promotion at a strategic level. So um, engaging with policy uh, and influencing relevant regulation, policy and strategy. It will work with bodies to develop and deliver a unified network of digital research infrastructure. What does that mean? Well, it means that we need to build on existing capability and infrastructure, working across UKRI and the broader landscape, for example, ADR UK, HDR UK, ONS and HBC facilities, to ensure that it leverages, informs and adds to what's already a complicated landscape. It could have been very easy for me to just set up a very big HPC facility and trusted research environments and so forth, but that isn't an effective use of our resources or a, a joined up way of going about things. The hub will also lead and commission cross-cutting coordinated data-focused uh, infrastructure programs, developing those long-term strategic partners with data owners, creating frameworks for sharing and documenting data, analytics, methods, software, template depth, uh, data sets, delivering fair digital footprint data, undertaking active and meaningful citizen-centered involvement and engagement, as Emma articulated earlier, is so crucial to work in this space. Supporting programs of methodological and theoretical development, creating an ethics and legal hub, providing that community level support, because we know that it's really required delivering hands-on training and supporting uh, knowledge transfer. We've got a good wobble going on there, haven't we? Um, so we will also have it focused um, to provide direction. It will focus on areas of national and international interest. These are to be set but embedding it within broader programs of work across and beyond UKRI is going to be critical. It's going to provide a foundational pillar and is supported by key programs, for example, that we know require the creation and access of use of digital footprint data is a key challenge for a number of cross-cutting programs. For example, UKRI's uh, AI strategy, digital twins, addressing the climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So alongside those cross-cutting programs, it will also issue data acquisition grants, provide innovation grants to support testing, experimentation and collaboration, and run workshops uh, to uh, bring together technicians uh, researchers, data engineers, and data owners to identify problems and build uh, solutions harmoniously and consistently. Unfortunately, what's out of scope, at least for the UKRI Infrastructure Fund, is capacity building, but we know that this is a critical part. However, ESRC is looking towards the development of our doctoral training network and centers of doctoral training to think about how we can ensure our postdoctoral training can deliver those critical skills required to access, manage, and work with these forms of data. So there are that's all very well and good. But we know that there are some critical challenges for digital footprint data. Uh, 
These are not collected for the primary purposes of research. They're created and held predominantly by private sector organizations, and they present a number of significant challenges for academic research and the provision of data services. How they're collected, engineered, curated, and made available to researchers is fundamentally different to traditional data services. And the challenges that they present closely align to the themes of this conference. For example, through all of the reviews, pilots, and consultations, etc., we know that there are structural challenges associated with supporting the partnerships and collaborations required. Researchers, uh, researchers' careers can be built on the back of leveraging the relationships with data owners where the academic reward structures actively work against the open data principles we promote. At the same time, we know that building the relationships and trust with data owners, uh, the time taken is considerable. And there are drivers for data owners to manage the relationships with academia that provide limited and managed access to small sections of the community, which inhibit their ability to access the full breadth and depth of expertise within our communities. Building on the back of these, we know that there are significant challenges around data quality. Digital footprint data sources can be populated with incorrect, uncalibrated, unformatted information. And it's critical that we understand as much of, about the data of how the data was created as possible. So that these data uh, sets can be cleaned and used without producing the misleading results. Compounding these challenges, we know that digital footprint systems are in continuous flux with changes to the people using them, how they are using them and the very systems themselves. These changes for researchers, particularly outside of those systems, um, are uh, difficult, impossible or hard to ascertain and present a significant challenge, particularly around trying to understand long-term trends using these kind of data. Alongside access and quality challenges, a significant challenge for digital footprint data is around archiving and re reproducibility. Challenges include, you know, the these, so volume, velocity, variety, all of that stuff but also drivers for data owners to support reproducibility, constraints on researchers using or sharing DFD, legal challenges, particularly around legal uh, personal data, ethical challenges around consent and privacy, and finally data documentation and management, for example, around version and addition uh, control. So, we don't expect these challenges to be addressed overnight. And we're working with our community and our advisory groups and data services on a number of different work streams that are outlined there. However, we're confident that the program of work that we've outlined and with the support of our communities, including yourselves, will be able to deliver that transformational shift in the creation, access and use of DFD putting us to deliver, putting us in a better place to deliver the data services of the future. So, um, ways to input. Well, I've outlined that um, we are at the moment commissioning a strategic advice team. They will be tasked with uh, developing a network of experts. Clearly, uh, a key audience for that will be the data librarians, stewards, managers, et cetera, and building on that expertise within the community. We also have the accelerator scheme that can um, support large and medium-sized and small projects, providing that foundational knowledge and expertise. I have a few questions for the audience. So are there similar international examples of digital footprints and what can we learn from these? Given the nature of the data and the nature of these services, how can traditional data management librarianship adapt to support researchers with these data? 
and are there international interventions, for example, policy, legislative uh, changes or interventions that we should be looking at? Above all, I'm open and flexible to, with how you engage. My email's here. Um, please submit your questions and suggestions to the mentee, um, and I'll pass on to uh, Giles and Amy to provide their reflections on what I've just outlined. So, if I, do you know how to put it to a big screen? Bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, would you mind putting Giles on? Yeah, would you like me to um, give some reflections, Bruce? Yeah, we're just trying to get you onto the screen of the um, uh, conference hall. Um, I can help shift it to uh, Giles okay. if you want me to. So, um, it's, who's uh, sharing the next presentation? Uh, he's not sharing, he's just going to be... Uh, oh, he's, he's not sharing. Yeah. yeah, just one sec. It's Giles. Who Let's should see. be? Where is Giles? There's be? Giles. Um, Et voila. Excellent. Well, it, I'm you sure it's no surprise point. to anybody in the audience, given that I've agreed to come along and be involved in that. I'm a massive supporter of, of uh, this initiative. Um, I should probably give maybe a bit of a background of my history in data analytics. So um, I started off uh, working in, in market research in the 1990s. And then I moved on to working uh, with, uh, I guess, early examples of digital footprint. So I started working with uh, sales data from um, UK, uh, supermarkets um, and was really taken by the fact that from my market research days um, quite often there were uh, uh, issues I guess with uh, not necessarily knowing the whole um, provenance of the data or um, not necessarily knowing um, uh, uh, is data missing because it's missing or because it was zero, et cetera, et cetera. And um, from working on, on uh, sales data, I then uh, moved on to uh, loyalty card data. So working for one of the, um, the major UK retailers on loyalty card data. And that turned out to be an amazing uh, source of data for understanding not only um, uh, what people were doing, but also where they were doing it, what time, and especially to the point of longitudinal data. Um, and I took that to that, that experience to then go and, and work at the uh, UK government, uh, yeah, using the same techniques to look at uh, welfare uh, data and how people interact. And I think that, um, Obviously, I'm a big supporter of this. I would take uh, maybe issue with one of the things that, that uh, you said, Bruce, which is around the area of data quality. So in my experience, digital footprints are some of the highest quality uh, data that we can have. And the problem isn't necessarily with the data quality. It's actually with our understanding of the data, how it's collected, what it actually represents. So if I use my own experiences of, uh, say, uh, um, loyalty card data, the quality, because it's an operational system whereby the retailer is giving money back to consumers, in the case of the retailer I was working with in the UK, uh, multiple millions of pounds, you know, those systems have to be correct and they're fantastically monitored. Now, that doesn't mean that they're like necessarily uh, ideal for researchers without a good understanding of that data, but it definitely uh, means that the actual uh, quality and, and validity and the checks that they've gone through are, are really quite um, major. 
So I'm passionate that uh, digital data or the digital footprints are an amazing source of understanding for how uh, humans behave. And I think with that understanding of exactly how was this data collected and who does it represent, you know, those things are um, things that uh, researchers uh, can actively work around. You know, if it's a power law distribution rather than a normal distribution, that's something that you can uh, allow for in, in your research. So um, super duper uh, supportive of this. I think what's interesting is that obviously the the, the value that's um, that's uh, released will be in part dependent on the number of, uh, of partners that uh, ESRC can bring on board. And I'd be optimistic that uh, with the right positioning and uh, the right support from government, that this could be you know, really quite, uh, uh, quite impressive. I think that if I, if I think of my own time, uh, you know, working for retail and now working um, at a large manufacturer, um, these businesses really understand that uh, yeah they have a place in society and part of that place in society is to is to give back um, and giving back to further you know humanity's understanding of of who we are and what we do is definitely um, you know something that can fit in with with corporate goals and I'd be optimistic that uh, if I speak to, for where I've worked. There are a lot of people who have, have you know, have been researchers themselves um, uh, and have a lot of empathy for uh, the research. So um, definitely uh, am optimistic. I definitely um, promote the fact that I think, uh, and I'm sure this is part of the plans, that we want to not only have uh, support in terms of access to the data, but uh, build out something akin to a GitHub of, you know, when people have uh, worked out how to summarize different data sources, that that's available to other researchers so that they don't need to um, go through that pain themselves. So, um, yeah, very, uh, very optimistic. Can't wait for it to, uh, uh, you know, the positioning of it will be important. And I think with a following wind and, uh, you know, the right um, uh, incentive and positioning, this can be something that we can really uh, incentivize uh, lots of uh, private sector companies to get involved in. I'll stop there. Perfect, I think I'm on the screen. <laughs> okay, I can see myself slightly. Um, so I've, I'm on the panel mainly to give the researcher perspective. And I think over the last couple of years, while looking into this project with the ESRC, there's been a huge amount of learning about what sort of challenges are still there and, and which we want to address. Um, and I think, I can probably best start my reflections with an actually an actual situation that I was in as a researcher. We're looking to work with companies and that our researchers are in on a you know, regular basis if you're working in fields where you want to use digital footprints data, which is you know, at the moment Zoom calls where you're the one researcher Kind of pitching your idea or trying to build a network often with multiple people from the company or the industry partners and in questions sitting on the other side and it always struck me how academia is really not made out for building these sorts of relationships and networks over time that are so crucial to deliver and, and open up digital footprints data because we're often 
stuck in our own little offices, incentivized to work in small groups, further our own research rather than maybe the research on a, on a national level and keep the sorts of, for example, the data sources, we spent a lot of time investing in networks and in um, conversation to get access to, to keep those rather much for ourselves rather than share them more broadly. That sort of experience, I think, um, was mirrored throughout the conversations that I had in the process of thinking about digital footprints. Often younger researchers saying that either there was already somebody more senior working with the company in question, and so it was very hard to get your foot in the door, or there were data sources that may be available that um, were that, that you know, have been accessed by researchers but weren't publicly shared and, and you would need to kind of collaborate with certain teams to get access to them. Or because of the lack of collective bargaining power of academics, we're so kind of uh, isolated that we didn't get access to important data in the first place. And so I think that the Digital Footprints Initiative and ESRC will counter a lot of issues like these, where just the structure of the current academic and funding landscape has not allowed us to um, really adapt to face this 21st century world. So as I kind of start off, the lack of collective bargaining power of academics working together incentivized to work for, for example, the national good rather than your own research group's good is one of those. But there are a couple more I want to highlight in, in my couple of minutes of reflections. The second is an issue that researchers routinely face and that comes up again and again, especially when you as a, as a social scientist work um, on new and emerging forms of data or on digital footprints data, is the lack of understanding of the people around you um, about what the work is that you're doing. That is especially prominent in, for example, ethical approval procedures, where you might be submitting some quite innovative work um, to ethics committees who have no idea um, what that sort of data is and what the up-to-date and current ethical frameworks around that are. Just yesterday, we had a Cambridge meeting uh, locally in my university about researchers interested in polarization from across many different faculties. And it was evident that for us, it was kind of a, a lottery about which ethics committee you got and what they would allow you to do with certain forms of data. This is similar in terms of legal services. A lot of these data sets do have legal processes going along them, whether that is an NDA or a data sharing agreement. Those things can take absolutely ages to get through departments in universities that don't know what um, exactly these processes are. For me, myself, it wasn't even a really innovative project. It took about nine to 10 months to get a a very simple data sharing agreement through Cambridge Legal Services. At that time, for some industry partners, that ship has sailed. <laughs> you know, like we're not working with it again. So again, these are very particular pain points but through conversations we hear time and time again that if, for example, the ESRC or other national bodies want to provide an up-to-date system, should need to, need to address. And the last problem and pain point I want to highlight is that this field is incredibly fast moving. What is up to date ethics? What's up to date legal? But also what's up to date ways of engaging with citizens and providing data services that empower those who give data rather than exploit their data in certain ways. These citizen centered designs are for me, who's just kind of there in parallel. They just develop at the speed of light while I'm trying to figure out how I do my research in a very contained space. So again, there's a lot of innovation going on across this data network, but because we're not linked up and because to keep up with industry, we are trying to accelerate our processes, the, the lack of communication of, and of linking together has meant that oftentimes innovation in certain parts of the sector take a long time to trickle down to, for example, the people who are designing research on the ground. And by the time that we're doing it, you know, the, they're already doing something else. So I think I'm incredibly excited for digital footprints because it targets many of these pain points, especially the, so the three that I've just highlighted are just the start. 
really. For example, the low collective bargaining power and the splintering of researchers um, who, whose incentives don't always align. I think processes like the accelerator program, ways in which we can innovate in funding can really change the system as well as a governmental or, or a national body, not a governmental, a national body that looks into how we develop these links and relationships so that they're not dependent on one researcher but are often negotiated in a, in a broader sense and then shared in a broader sense. Part of the, the data acquisition grants Bruce talked about are really interesting because they're, we can try to think about how do we fund those people who build relationships with industry in a way that it rewards them, but where the reward isn't keeping that data and relationship closed off to, to other researchers across the board. The second is that the, the the hub of digital footprints is looking to create um, ethics and legal teams that will help universities across uh, the UK in understanding the issues and that can allow that sort of support. So it doesn't matter if you're at a university or a department who really knows what they're doing, or you're at one where nobody has done it before, that they can all go to joint resource. And we're not duplicating efforts, but we're also not slowing down research. And lastly, I think it, the linking up of industry of different parts of innovation will challenge both academics and industry to do better, to take up innovations like citizen centers approaches, to think about ethical cooperation, think about things like, you know, how do we do data storage and data analysis in a secure way. So I think the past investments have really shown how much can be done with digital footprints data. We have already done a lot. But we've also learned a lot about the things that aren't working so well and that um, this new investment can really target. So I think it's a really exciting time, especially to learn about what other international colleagues have done. Um, so I'm very excited that we're talking about this today. Um, yes, that would be great. Thank you. All right. Well, they've posed some uh, interesting things for us to get started to talk about. I want to pose the first question, and we have plenty of time for discussion. I think in the history of conference presentations, we're ahead of schedule, so that's great. So we have some extra time for discussion. And I'll have I have mics up here, so I can come around um, for those in the audience who want to ask a question. But I'm going to ask the first one. And um, what do you think is going to be the most significant challenge or challenges, set of challenges for delivering data services that support access and creation and use of digital footprint data? That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want me to go first and then invite? Okay. Um, uh, I think it's a, a number of uh, aspects that uh, highlighted in the uh, presentation that really uh, highlight the challenges that we have. One uh, was touched on uh, by Giles in that, you know, this program of work will be built upon the ability of uh, digital footprints and the broader community in terms of building those relationships with the data owners. And that takes time. It takes time, it takes um, trust, it takes uh, uh, the ability to build relationships and understand both the data, but also the data partners and the owners and what those drivers are. But we've demonstrated that this can happen, and we're going to make sure that actually we reach out across the community and build on those established networks and relationships. Secondly, um, we have very aspirational goals, and some of those challenges are quite significant. And some of those are quite embedded, and it points to some of the work that um, Amy talked about. There are inbuilt frameworks, structures, cultures that potentially work against some of the ambitions of digital footprints, particularly with regards to um, uh, sharing data and providing data for the national good. 
Now, there are things that we can do as a, a research council and um, working across government that will help address those challenges. But those things are really embedded and culture and structures take time to uh, change. So it's going to have to take a significantly long program to actually change those behaviors and you know, really focused interventions to address some of those challenges. I'll hand over to Giles and Amy. Giles, do you want to reflect? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I definitely agree with all of those points and uh, a lot of Amy's experiences I've experienced from the, uh, the data you know, owner side, and I can definitely uh, um, uh, relate to those. I think the challenge will be one of um, getting up to uh, uh, sufficient uh, size. I think that, you know, gaining the um, uh, momentum and getting the flywheel going. I think that uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the more data that gets in there, the more obviously different data that can be combined and you know, the more relevant it, um, uh, potential it has. Also, the more that any kind of stigma or reluctance from a supplier, you know, the, the best thing for, for me to be able to say as a member of, let's say, a, a um, consumer goods company uh, to, to uh, you know, my bosses about why we should uh, be providing our data is, and why they shouldn't worry about that is to say, well, our competitors are already doing it or other similarly, you know, similar size companies or, um, are already doing it. So I do think once we get to a critical mass, uh, you know, then uh, it will uh, sort of drive itself. So I think that energy and um, uh, uh, initial, um, you know, getting those initial partners in and really getting out uh, yeah, great communications uh, will will be will be key, you know, and uh, getting those early uh, early contributors and uh, on both sides because obviously you know if if I'm a data supplier and I'm feeding data in, then you know the payback for me is when that data is being used by researchers to uh, you know uh, either as data for good or 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 um, uh, you know things that I can I can then point to to uh, being our contribution uh, to, to that so um yeah getting up to that critical mass I think is probably the the, the number one challenge mm -hmm. I agree with all that's been said, really. Um, I think it's matching up the wants and needs from very different sectors that have very different structures, incentives, motivators. Um, and I think we see this difficulty on small scale projects. I'm part of a big investment by a foundation where they want to improve the evidence of the ed tech space and technology and education, which is really booming. And they had this idea of funding researchers and startups and kind of them helping each other. But naturally, if a startup providing data is inherently risky because the researcher might use it to show that your product doesn't work. And so I think there, those it all looked very good from the outside, but the in, inherent incentive structures around research and evidence kind of hit, hit each other and we're trying to figure out the, the way out now. So I think part of these growing pains will just be part of the, the process as well. And I think as, as Giles said so well, is that this building of incentive and momentum, I think will be underpinned by these connection building and, and general willingness to understand the other side and, and the other parties in the room, as well as the innovativeness on the ESRC side, because I think we need to conceptualize the way we fund, the way we support very differently in this space. I think the, the kind of funding system that has been in place for more traditional forms of research 
that is less connected, more individual, more lone genius models might not be as applicable in this space. Um, so I think there are, there are multiple. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and reflecting on actually um, both yours and Amy's, uh, uh, Giles and Amy's comments, um, it was interesting uh, you highlighted the quali quality aspect. And I think you are um, right that actually some data sources are incredibly, you know, uh, uh, of of high quality and the challenge is you know um actually not necessarily describing what the data is but how they were created and that points to a presentation um that was uh, a key point yesterday but also a reflection that this is an incredibly large landscape you know we're not talking about one data type or one data provider or one sector actually it's a very uh heterogeneous landscape and actually in some parts of the uh, landscape the data quality can be incredibly high and then for other aspects it can be incredibly um low or at least the challenges in terms of uh, working with those data for high quality academic research can be very um apparent so um, that was one aspect, and again, building on um, Giles and Amy's um, point, I think one of the key drivers in digital footprints is to try and take away the pain on both sides um, uh, working in this space, and it comes around um, the uh, code uh, aspect that you uh, highlighted, but also the data license agreements, the um, ethical approvals. As I said, this is a very large, diverse landscape. And what's the issue is, is that it's not connected and that people are doing large amounts of work, spending long hours and significant resources working through the same challenges. And what is key is that we help connect that landscape up so people don't have to go through the same pain. And actually, we can concentrate on delivering the science as opposed to trying to address the uh, challenges that are currently uh, researchers are battling with. I think just to, to add to that, Bruce, um, naturally, there's also a real diversity in the ESRC researcher landscape. We have researchers with very different approaches, ideas, um, topics of interest. And I feel like often we, we are grouped together as researchers, but our needs are very, very different. Um, so I've been on a lot of governmental committees, and it, only, it has taken me, I think, two, three years to realize that a lot of times we're talking about completely different worlds. <laughs> you know, I, I look at mental health, so I cannot use an anonymized data set. I need something that links to personal mental health, well-being, healthcare data. And so for me, it's not as much, I don't need the whole network of people. I don't need a big representative sample at, at the beginning, at least. For me, it's important that I have this linkage possibility between data sets. While often in the computational social sciences, they want completely different forms of data. They want the whole network. They don't really mind if it's completely anonymized, but they really need that whole global population. And we're often crammed into the same room as if we have the same needs, but our needs are inherently different. And it took me a long time to realize why, I think we keep on giving different advice to the same policymakers who must be very confused um, <laughs> down the line. So hopefully this sort of diversity of research in in the social sciences and will be um, boosted as well there. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? One, is it on? Okay, I, you have a question. Yes? No. What's that? No. All right, excellent. Hi, oh, yeah, it's Vanessa Higgins from the UK Data Service. Um, so, hi. hi. Um, so, I just wanted to ask because you just touched on it right at the very end, but before that, you'd not talked about data linkage. Um, so, how does the this new digital footprint service 
fit in with linking established sources of data, such as large surveys or large cohort studies with these uh, digital footprint data. Is that part of this new initiative? Yes. So um, linkage uh, of digital footprint data and uh, established uh, data sources will be critical. They both have their um, challenges, strengths, weaknesses, um, and linking um, uh, two more traditional uh, data sets will be critical. For example, you know, uh, for uh, social media uh, data linkage to our longitudinal studies, uh, we know that, uh, for example, Closer has undertaken a significant amount of work around that, and there are various. Uh, ethical, legal, operational, technical challenges around that that are being worked at, uh, worked through um, across our community, and it's about bringing those together. Um, so yeah, the power um, of bringing uh, more traditional data sets and these digital footprint data sets together will be um, uh, really strong but there are significant challenges to work through, um, uh, you know, over and above sort of response rates and uh, approval rates and all those kind of things. Okay. Uh, Rostina Angelova from Bulgarian Sociological Association. I will provoke you with one question, which is coming a little bit from the context in which I work. Uh, and just it will be interesting for me to hear your arguments. Um, in our context, very often, either from academic circles or um, from other sources, all the time there is debate to what extent we can extrapolate uh, the results of such uh, data, uh, can to what kind of um, uh, general population we can refer them. And in this sense, the big uh, question is can we pretend for representativeness, either because users can use uh, several um, digital devices and we don't know if we overestimate the behavior of some subgroups and underestimate of other and uh, any, any other um, challenges like this. And it will be interesting for me to, to hear how you can uh, defend the value of this data and of course, I understand that every case is very specific. Arguments in every case can be different. But uh, I mean, because from a very classical perspective, uh, some scientists can say these data are not valuable because they don't give us. So you understand. Thanks. Um, Giles. Can I put you on the spot to answer that question? Because I know you sit on our secondary data analysis initiative and um, yeah. I mean, have some is, reflections this is, on this. This has been my life a little bit. Um, so I was talking before about when I was looking at loyalty card data and uh, people would say to me, oh, this loyalty card data, it's only from one retailer in the UK and people go and buy their food in other retailers. And so how can you know it's representative? Uh, and I think there's two arguments for why that's maybe like a something that we should get over. Um, the first is that within any digital sample, there typically are people who will be behaving in a way where you're seeing all of their behavior. Um, so if you're saying that people logging in from multiple devices, there will be some people who will always log in from one device. If you're looking at, say, uh, grocery loyalty card data, which is something I know, uh, there will be a big proportion of people who only do their shopping at one retailer, so you still get a view of everything they're eating. Um, so, yeah. Again, it comes down to this understanding of the data and making sure that the data isn't just like plonked there and uh, you know, researchers are left to have to try and work it out for themselves, but they can actually get access to people who can uh, explain how the data is, is collected and, and then you know, um, subdivide it themselves. 
The, the second point, so if the first point is that you don't necessarily have to, to take all the data, you can take a subsample which meets the criteria. The second is really the difference between looking at data that's behavioral versus looking at claimed behaviors through maybe more sort of classical research techniques. And the difference is, is really quite stark. Um, behavioral data, which has been, you know, where we're observing uh, people's behavior, where there's no reason for them uh, to uh, claim to be doing anything. There's no problem about what their memory is. There's no problem about uh, their availability of who we get to speak to. You know, all of these are problems that are really hard to tackle in traditional research. And so they kind of get understated in my opinion. And I think with the digital data, the fact that what you're getting is a footprint or a exhaust or a kind of offshoot of, uh, of, of, of what's happened and an observation that's in kind of, yes, it might be um, biased in the sense of it's only from one retailer or it's only from one website, um, but that's a bias you can understand. So I really do think that, um, you know, the value here is something that we really, uh, you know, as, as a research community really need to go after. You know, this, you know, what people do rather than what they claim they do if you, if you interview them. You know, is really what we should be interested in in the vast majority of cases. So I'm a big believer in the fact that the digital data, you know, the uh, shortcomings are a lot easier to understand and, and to take account of. And the value of the observation rather than the claim, the claim of behavior is, is massive. Um, I definitely, I, I feel like I've probably got quite a, uh, a strong view on that, and I'd be keen to hear what Amy's got to say on the subject. But uh, you know, that that's my view. I think you said that very well. I think in my area, it's naturally a bit different. Um, thinking a lot more about data linkage to survey data sets or other data investments where we can track at least some of the nature of where our missing data lies. So. Yes, well, I think, as Giles said, every form of data has limitations um, in my area around understanding online harms. Um, we're basing most of our work on self-report of what people see or do on social media because we don't have the right data access, which is a huge, huge problem, <laughs> not just for us as researchers, but as society, when our government is building regulation on the basis of more or less people guessing how much time they spend online or guessing yeah. how, what sorts of things they saw. So I think it's the, it's the mix and the, I think in science, what, I don't think there a perfect study exists, but what we do is we slowly triangulate towards the right answer using different methods with different limitations so that if all of the different slightly limited or crappy studies point in the right direction or in the same direction, then we know we're, we're getting somewhere. So uh, for me, yeah, I think there are limitations everywhere, but if we can have different sorts of methodology, at least those limitations or biases will hopefully cancel each other out. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, to add to that, I think, I mean, the triangulation point is, is very well made. What digital data is fantastic for is quantifying things. You know, what happened to, to Amy's example, like how long are people staying online? You know, if you ask somebody that, they'll just, you know, my guess is that they'd either tell you, you know, 28 hours in the day or, you know, three minutes, you know, and it would be just so far away from the reality. So that, like quantifying things is just brilliantly what digital data is, is very strong for. Um, and looking at things, uh, you know, uh, trends as well, quantifying over time. What it's not going to give you, uh, or, or, or what it's going to be uh, more limited on, is understanding why people are behaving in, in certain ways. But, um, yeah, one, one area where I've seen a lot of success is 
you use statistical methods to identify groups of, of behaviors and then go and ask those people why they're behaving in, in that way and, and uh, link it in that in that form, which uh, you know is, is another way to, to bring to bring the benefits of certain um, uh, of different data collection methods uh, to uh, counteract the, uh, the shortcomings. Yeah, and to build on your points as well, I think, um, you know, it, sometimes it's about the questions that you're asking and what are, you know, well, it's always about the questions that you're asking and what are the most appropriate data sources to uh, answer those uh, questions. And, you know, there are inherent challenges with uh, a broad variety of work that we support. So, you know, that we know that there are hard to reach populations that uh, are not necessarily captured in national statistics or traditional academic surveys. Um, we know that there's been um, challenges about the um, uh, timeframes uh, on which uh, uh, national statistics and um, uh, traditional academic uh, sources can be generated as well. So, for example, um, ONS and I think the Joint Biosecurity Centre you were using a linked uh, consumer register uh, to understand uh, populations at a sort of local area level um, that was more timely than you know the last census uh, or that was generated 11 years ago so it's about trying to give researchers and policy makers and uh, others the most appropriate tools to be able to answer the challenges and questions that they have and you know that was incredibly apparent um you know reflecting on the elixir presentation from the uh, COVID pandemic, you know, what was required then was, you know, data uh, on uh, the population uh, and how that was uh, impacting, um, you know, mobility trends, economic outputs, um, you know, community uh, spread, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a look at the Royal Society's Delve report and, you know, it was a key challenge was access to these kind of data sources to uh, address the fundamental questions that policymakers, academics, and uh, health practitioners had at the time. We have a question uh, here that I want to pose to the panel. And I think your question kind of got a little bit at this, but I want to be sure to get to this online one. So how will these data sets be shared? How will they be, uh, will they be added to the UK data service? Will you need accredited researcher status to access? And so kind of circling back to um, the presentation this morning by Dr. Gordon that you, you know, a lot of this, you have to have researcher access. So is that going to be the case? And how can data librarians engage with, uh, with this data? Do you want me to tackle that one first of all? So um, in terms of uh, how will they be accessed? Well, um, in terms of access levels, it will obviously depend on the data um, uh, that's being um, created, accessed and used. So, you know, for highly personal, commercially sensitive data, you can see that uh, we would need to operate uh, a framework similar to the five safes model where you have accredited researchers, et cetera, um, safe settings, all of that kind of stuff. Um, for other aspects, actually, um, the opportunities for open data um, uh, are incredibly rich and that provides an opportunity, um, both in terms of um, providing that data and information to um, academic uh, researchers, but also to broader communities, whether that's um, uh, supporting 
uh, citizen-centered science, uh, citizen-centered engagement, uh, policymakers, et cetera, et cetera. So there will be a broad spectrum of data access arrangements relate, uh, that you know, are appropriate for the data that are going to be held. In terms of how people will be able to access this and the sort of different data services, clearly um, ESRC is reviewing our data services post-2024. Um, what the consultation recognized is that there was a clear need for a separate intervention in this space that builds on the network skills, capabilities, relationships across the academic landscape. What I'm incredibly passionate about is that we don't make a complicated landscape even more complicated. So where we can build on existing digital research infrastructure, for example, trusted research environments, HPC facilities, provision of data services, um, access arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, we will do so um, because we want to make it as simple as possible for our uh, communities. And it is going to be focused in on understanding the needs of our users and researchers. I, I actually have a question. Um, what's your preservation plan and how much of your budget is going to that? So as a curator, as an historian, I'm not sure if what I was hearing you say is that you're going to pass off some of that to some entities that already exist, but you're, you're, you've got a lot of pounds to work with. So I'm wondering <laughs> how much of that is going to long, short and long-term preservation so that historians 50 years from now can have access to this, this resource. So um, in terms of uh, the preservation activities, um, there are um, a significant amount of work is focused in on um, the preservation of these data sources for um, future research and work. Um, you know, it's it's criminal almost that large swathes of data that potentially could be incredibly valuable for social and economic research. At the moment, they're not, you know... <laughs> data is seen as a new oil it's a new asset for um you know uh the community well actually in some cases it's potentially liability <laughs> once it's passed you know sort of the uh, business need business value quite a few organizations are destroying it because they see it as a liability and actually what is key is that we preserve what potentially could be incredibly valuable resources for you know later research for the good of um, uh, the community so in terms of percentage I don't have a percentage to hand I'm afraid but a significant amount of work uh, uh, is going to be focused on those preservation activities and making sure those data are appropriately managed for future research and use. So is that in terms of you're going to hire x number of people to do this or? Yes so um, as I said we will be building on what's already there within the community so you know people such as uh, the smart uh, data foundry data Foundry, uh, Edinburgh, CDRC, et cetera, et cetera, have, you know, the knowledge, expertise and capabilities to be able to do this. But also we will be reaching out across the community and supporting those data librarians, engineers, data stewards, et cetera, in terms of that hands-on training, capacity building. So it's about bringing that network together and trying to support the network, the community as much as possible. Giles, Amy, did you have anything to say on that? Well, just to say that your point about uh, data being a liability at companies is completely right. Um, you know, the companies I've worked at, there will be a retention policy, which is as soon as you don't want to, as soon as you aren't going to be using this data, then you really ought to get rid of it. So, yeah, I think it's a really nice. Uh, there is actually a, a positive sell for um, for for um, data partners that uh, you know the ESRC can take that responsibility 
<laughs> quality of their hands. <laughs> so that's definitely one that should go into our kind of uh, credentials deck, I think. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's definitely true. Well, I know that you wanted to ask the audience some questions, so we have time for that. So would you like to pose your questions to the audience? Yeah, that would be perfect. Thank you. Uh, can we see them here? Can, okay. Uh, I don't know if you can see them online. Share screen. Can you see the questions online now? Yep. Fantastic. Thank you. So as I say, are there um, examples internationally of digital footprints, similar investments that we should be looking, uh, looking towards? Uh, what can we lear learn from these? And I think importantly for uh, this conference, given the nature of these data and uh, of these services, how can we support, be supported by traditional mm -hmm. data management librarians uh, to adapt the support that they provide to researchers with these data. I heard um, a presentation from uh, somebody at Harvard, uh, I believe it was, who was you know, focused in on uh, acquiring these closed proprietary data sets for their uh, data partners and what are the challenges um, that that uh, comes with them and what are the uh, what are the ways that we can help you as a community in terms of supporting access to these uh, data for your um, uh, research partners etc and finally, are there international interventions, for example, policy or legislative that we should be looking at? So who's ready? Aaron, is there Aaron, is there any way to see if any of our online audience has put anything in the chat or no? Okay. We can tell you because we can see it. Okay. All right. Deidre has. Oh, sorry. It's very, very, and we are, let's say, just one conversation of this initiative, and uh, it's uh, really new. So, but uh, the um, idea is uh, not international. Uh, we work with the team of um, journalists, uh, and uh, we will try to analyze. Uh, specific uh, behavior of people who are reading internet medias uh, and to try to link this with some classical public opinion polls and to see how this data can be used as um, uh, how to say it, prediction modeling of future uh, electoral behavior uh, but uh, combined with waiting procedures and uh, link with classical public opinion polls. But it's really very new. I didn't intend to share because we, we are at the point zero. <laughs> if you have some experience in this, it will be interesting for us or someone else. Thank you. And if you do have um, comments or advice post here, um, by all means, um, you can submit them through uh, Menti, and I'd love to looks like there's some see questions. them. Looks like there's some questions in the chat. I don't know if you can open that up. No? I think it just is me testing the chat. <laughs> okay, well, then you guys do it. Um, okay, well, if we've rolled up in terms of questions and advice from the audience, should we draw it to a close? Sorry. Should we draw it to a close? Sure. Well, and, and as Bruce said, if you have other questions that come to mind, uh, please reach out. I know he very much wants feedback as they continue to develop this program. So thank you so much for coming, for your engagement, and for your support. Thank you so much. Nice to hear from you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Amy. It's nice to see you. Bye. Bye.